Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences. With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. O Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion, and what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ, our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you to forgive our sins, give peace of mind to those in distress and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far, and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherds, sanctify the priests, and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows. Drive away all conflicts and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. We raise glory to you, to your blessed Father and to your living Holy Spirit now and forever.
the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in its victory with your pure apostles we raise glory to you to your father and to your holy spirit now and forever Kanishat, Aloho Kanishat, Hail to the Kanishat, Loyo to Itra Hamalan. Kanishat, Aloho Kanishat, Hail. with joy from the mountain Sunday is a feast so great offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and their children forever. Brothers and sisters, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared with the glory to be revealed for us. For creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. For creation was made subject to futility, not of its own accord, but because of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from slavery to corruption and share the glorious and freedom of the children of God. We know that all creation is groaning in labor pains even until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we also groan within ourselves as we await for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, now hope that succeeds for itself is not hope, for hope for what one sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with endurance. In the same way, the Spirit too comes to aid our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. 
and the one who searches hearts knows what is in the, the intention of the Spirit, because it intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Grace on the listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, and Jesus then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness, but who despised everyone else. Two men went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke thus within himself. O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of mankind, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes on my entire income. But the publican stood off at a distance and he would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast and he prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and the one who humbles himself shall be exalted. This is the truth, peace be with you. He who exalts himself shall be humbled. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We all do quite a few good things in our lives. That's doubtless. We also screw up a lot of things during our lives also. That is also doubtless. But we tend to remember all the good things we do and we tend to kind of ignore the bad things unless it really blows up in our face. That's just human psychology. That's just the way we see things. 
But because of that reason, though, we tend, for exactly the same reasons, to see the faults of our neighbor first and not the good things they're doing. It's just inverse. It's just the psychology since the fall from the garden. In other words, the history of mankind has always been this way. This gospel today is the 18th chapter of St. Luke. The 17th chapter deals with the end of the world, in part. And our Lord finishes at the end of that 17th chapter with a very unusual phrase, that there where the corpses, the vultures gather. And it's an unusual phrase. Very, um, it's not shocking, but it does call our attention. Because what our Lord is saying, in the same way that we recognize that when you see the birds of prey circling in the air over a woods or over the farmlands, you know something is either struggling at the end of their life or something has just died. And so the vultures are gathered towards the corpse where they feed, they eat. But our Lord uses the image for himself that where our Lord is, he gathers in those who receive nourishment from him. And so in the imagery, our Lord is the corpse and we are the vultures. So it's a strange image, but it's one in which we have an experience of, especially in those days when everybody was a farmer. It is the term that he uses as he concludes this section teaching them about the end of time. But it is also the reality that we live in presently in which through the divine mysteries we are constantly being gathered into our Lord. So we mentioned a number of weeks ago, this is why we assemble on the day of the resurrection. It's not to go to church. It is to be assembled within the Christ in which we are then edified, built up into, as St. Paul says, the full maturity of Christ. We are developed and drawn. And so all our Lord is saying is that on that last moment, when our Lord appears to us in his glory, we will be gathered up into him. As we have been during this time on earth, week after week, day after day, into the divine mysteries, and then when he appears in glory, ending all time, those who are his members will be gathered up into him. It's a quite a stunning vision. And that is why we partake in the Eucharist. It's why we receive Holy Communion. The communion is at the very end of this entire assembly because it is the pinnacle of being gathered into the Word incarnate. So that's the end of chapter 17. Then there are two things in the lessons that are given. We're told there's a parable before this one of the unjust judge who will not listen to a widow's case because one, she can't give a bribe, she's impoverished, and two, she really can't even pay for the services. So he's not interested in taking her case. And this woman has nothing else except perseverance, banging on his door, pestering him whenever she sees him in the streets. And finally, he gives in. Now, at the beginning of this parable, our Lord says, he gave this parable, St. Luke tells us that he gives this parable for those to encourage them to pray and to do not give up, literally not to faint. Don't stop praying. And then you have this parable of this poor woman who's banging on the door, banging on the door, banging on the door, until finally the judge is so annoyed in this parable, he just says, well, I, I, not for any good reasons, but other than just this woman has become so profoundly annoying, I'll hear her case. And our Lord says to the, the people around him, he says, do you not think that God, who is infinite goodness, will not render to you what is just and good? And so he gives that as a parable, and then we're given this parable today. And it's also prefaced that our Lord gives this teaching to those who see themselves as righteous and look down upon others. That's why in the beginning we talked about the psychology. It's easy for me to remember all the good things I do and the good things I have done in my life. I'm a little less enthusiastic for the bad things. 
And what happens is we confuse ourselves and our minds about what it means to be just. To be just means we're being put back into order, we're being justified, we're being brought back into integrity. But as we mentioned, psychologically, it's easy for us to see the faults of others. And in fact, we know psychologically that almost always whatever I find most annoying in the other person is precisely what I am guilty of because I won't address it in my life, so I see it in everyone else's life. And so normally that trait is the very thing of which I am guilty. We know this psychologically. So what our Lord is saying is a couple of things in this parable. We all know the parable very well. The first thing to note in this parable is the Pharisee says nothing wrong. Everything he says is true. That he fasts twice a week, that he ties, he follows the law. He follows the law of Moses. And yet, what he's also doing, and even when he says, that, thank you God for not allowing me to be like the rest of humanity. Now that sounds pretty horrible, and it is horrible to some extent. But when he says, adulterers, murderers, dishonest, he's just echoing the prophets of the Old Testament. It talks about humanity always being guilty of all of these sins. So what the Pharisee says in all of these things, there's nothing wrong with it. What's wrong with it is what he is doing. And he points out this publican who's near him, like this man here, you know. He's, he, he works, he collaborates with the occupying forces, he collects his taxes for them. This man is, is horrible. And it's not necessarily wrong either. He is, it is horrible. He is collaborating with an occupying force that's oppressive. And the publican who is there just recognizes in his life all the horrible things he's done. So he won't even look up towards the temple. So when you have the division of the temple, when it says they go up to the temple, you have the temple, the altar in front of it, then you have what's called the court of the priest, then you have the court of the men, and then you have the court of the women. And that's how the temple is broken down. So we're told that this publican will not even look up at the altar in the temple. He just stays there looking at the ground, pounding his chest, asking for mercy. And of course, remember the purpose of this parable is to talk about considering ourselves righteous and comparing ourselves to others. And this is what we do notoriously from the time we can talk, right? This is why we stand in this kitchen and we scream. She got a bigger piece of cake. We're always comparing ourselves to others. And of course, what we tend to do, remembering the good things that I do, I will then tend to look at the bad things other people do, and that will actually help me become more smug. That I'm pretty good. Because I can always find some wretch that's more wretched than me always looking down, always lowering the category, not because we're trying to lower the criterion, but it's because it's making me feel better. And of course, the church has never operated this way. We have canonization ceremonies for a reason. Kanon in Greek just means standard. The canonization ceremony means we're just recognizing a standardization, this person's life. And of course, the saints that are standardized, these are geniuses. Every generation has holy people in it. Every generation has saints. But amongst those very good people, there are individuals who are exalted publicly to say this is truly canon, this is a standard. And that is where our eyes are supposed to be to see how they lived their lives, then it helps me realize, ha, huh, I haven't really done that much. But when we look down upon others, which is what literally the word despise means, to look down upon, when we look down upon others, to judge by that, not only to judge them, but we also have then the illusion that we're doing fine because we're not that bad. This is the meaning behind this parable. Both of these men say things that are completely true. 
but it's the context and the manner in which they say them and what they actually produce within their souls that is the problem and the teaching of this parable. So for us, there are two things to draw from this. Is the context that follows just after this parable is the famous episode of the mothers coming with their children. And they want this wonderful rabbi to bless him, bless the children. And the apostles are just annoyed with all these kids. Just, will you just get out of here? And we're told that. They start rebuking these mothers and the kids. Look, he's a busy man. He's got things to do. Scram. And our Lord stops and he says to the apostles, no, no, let the children come up here. And these children come up. And we're told our Lord puts his hand in blessing on all of these little children. And he says to the apostles, you let them come to me because such is the kingdom of heaven. And you must become like one of these children or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's more than just charming. It is a profoundly theological lesson. And we've talked about this before. When our Lord talks about becoming like children, it is the wonderment. Everything is new. Everything is surprising. Everything is stunning for children. You break into things, you pull things down, you pull all the pots and pans out of the kitchen, you mangle the cat, you pull things out of the garage, you get under tables, you break things because you wanna see how they work because everything is a source of wonder. That is what our Lord says you must be. Everything that happens in God's providence is in itself wonderful, but we lose that sense because we become jaded. So that's the context of this parable today. So the two lessons that we can draw from this parable is one, we must know the lives of the saints. We must know who these people are. It's told of the Curie of ours as one of his cherished books. He just had a collection of lives of the saints. And for the few hours that he had free each day, which was taken from his sleep because he only slept for an hour and a half every 24 hours, and did this until at the age that he died at 73. But his entire adult life read these lives of the saints over and over and over and over again. And we're, set, we're told that at the end of his days, in his 60s, in his 70s, 50s, when he was older in his life of his priesthood, he would speak about these saints as if he had known them personally just because he had assimilated who these geniuses were generation after generation in the history of the church. That's the first thing. Because if we keep the lives of the saints in front of us, we have no difficulty seeing how far short we fall of their lives. So that is the first thing. Our standard is above, not below. It's not to be looking down upon the fact that my, the woman who lives three doors down from us is shacked up with the fifth guy. God have mercy on her, whatever. That's her life. But it's not something that I judge my life by. But it's the brilliance of those geniuses. So first of all, we have to on a regular basis, even if it's only 15 minutes a day, familiarize ourselves with the lives of the saints. We live in a period of time in which we're all literate. We can all read. For the history of the world, that has not been the case. We have not had at any time in the history of the world access to so much knowledge at our fingertips. And what do we do? We play video games, which requires no great intelligence, certainly no reading skills, or at least for little blurbs that pop up on occasion. And this is tragic. This is tragic. Because it's such a waste of time and a waste of intelligence and brilliance. It generates million, billions and billions of dollars a year in wasted money. But from this parable, we learn that we look to the higher things to have those standards. That's the first problem. That's why the publican falls and does not leave the temple in the state of grace, we're told in the parable because he has forgotten the saints of the old law. He has forgotten the great prophets. And he only looks at the publicans and those who are messing up their lives. 
So the second thing that we draw from it, why then the examination of conscience each day is so important in our spiritual lives. It is not a laundry list. It is not navel gazing. It is to place ourselves before the light of God and to ask for the grace that we see ourselves as God sees us. And then we look over our day because what we're looking for are the obstacles that stop us from also becoming geniuses in the spiritual life. These hurdles that we trip over, these obstacles that stop us, this is what the examination of conscience is. It's not to generate a list for confession. It is to see the things that are holding me down. And as St. John of the Cross talks about, you only need a thread tied to the bird's leg to keep it from flying. It doesn't take a lot. And that's why the examination of conscience, then we look over our day, our words, our thoughts, our actions, and the things that we should have done, the omissions that we didn't do. That's the examination of conscience. Again, it's not a laundry list, it's not navel gazing, it's not introspection. We are asking in the light of God to show us where am I have the snags that are stopping me from moving. Then we make our act of contrition. Contrition literally means I'm busted up over this I, because I see where I'm being hampered. We make our act of contrition, but most importantly, we finish that examination of conscience by asking for the grace to do better tomorrow. In this light, allow me to enter more deeply into the light and transform me within your sacred heart. The examination of conscience is an essential practice of the spiritual life for those who are serious. Now we understand why this parable ends, that the one who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who thinks he's great, doing just fine, I'm terrific, will come to the truth at some point and is going to be humiliated, is going to be humble. And for far too many people, sadly, this must be the day of their death in which in the divine light of justice they see exactly what their life has been. And how unintelligent it would be for us not to look at those things already before that day and to have taken advantage of the mercy of God and the goodness of his grace in seeing ourselves in the divine light and not compared to the poor things that are bumbling around in this world. And that's why the second part is, but he who humbles himself he who sees himself truly as he is. That's all that humility means. Humis is the question of the soil, originally in Latin. The one who truly sees himself is brought from the dust of the earth as a child of Adam, and who understands the grace from above that God desires to grant to him, that truly then he who humbles himself shall be exalted. It is a beautiful phrase locking in all of these parables in chapter 18. So as usual, I encourage you, take some time this week, read chapter 17 of St. Luke and chapter 18, and then place yourself daily before the divine light to allow yourselves, ourselves, to see ourselves as God sees us. And in that blessed humbling, May we find and achieve the grace of exaltation, which can only be found within the sacred heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the glory and the Lord of God, who has spoken to the gods. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world. Tell of Madame Penda Loho, Alberta Loho, no Hane Tayo, Wayman Sugo, Taibo Tao, Kayo Lalbite of Westgodem, Hayek Low, Hot Good Shelf. Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbella. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
in after of twelve o'clock, seven five four. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice, and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith which is pleasing to the Lord. your peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim. Dani 
Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in memory of me until I come again. And we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father saying, we your sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we glorify you we profess our faith in you and we ask you have compassion on us O God have mercy on us and hear us how awesome is this moment O my beloved for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin monio, anin monio, anin monio, ni te moro rojo chayu kodisho, unachen alainu anu korbono hono. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. We raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith. With blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, St. Charbel of Raha, and his sister M. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm, and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and with holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make, Make us, us worthy, O Lord, Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for new life, O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. Yeah. 
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So we still have the supply line problem with our printer, so there's no bulletin printed this week, though we did send out a PDF form of it. So make sure as you go out, grab the flyers for the annual celebration that we have at the end of September. It will be on Saturday the 25th for the Hafli. Hafli just means celebration in Arabic. And we'll look forward to seeing you all there. 
And the last thing is, today they have made muffins downstairs, so you can go straight downstairs and there will be muffins and coffee for you, for those who wish. It is lovely to always see you. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.